Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today we have Dr. Sydney Cohen. And Dr. Cohen has a full-time practice as a psychologist for 35 years in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. He's the author of two books, Your Self-Sabotaging Inner Bully and Inner Blocks to Losing Weight. He has an internet TV show, a Facebook video show called The Dr. Sid Show, and I really just can't wait for you to meet him. You're going to have an amazing view of what we experience after betrayal. You're also going to learn how likely or unlikely it is that a couple will rebuild or move on based on what he's seen in his 35 years of working with couples. All right, let's get started. Okay, and I am so excited to speak with Dr. Sidney Cohen today. Welcome to the podcast. I just can't wait to dive in on all the great things we're going to be talking about. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Debbie. I'm really glad to be here. I would love for you to explain betrayal. How do you define it? This is the definition of betrayal that I've been using for quite a while now. And I use the definition I'm about to give because it, as you'll see in a moment, it has a, a broad application to different kinds of betrayal. So the definition that I use is any significant feeling of letdown by someone or something important to you based on what you believed you had the right to believe they would never do to you. That certainly sums it up and makes sense. What are some examples that you've come across in your practice, in your daily life of betrayal? Certainly as much as any example of betrayal is the one that I believe it's safe to say most people pretty automatically connect with the word betrayal, which is infidelity. Mm -hmm. Clearly, as much as any, uh, a straightforward example of betrayal. However, in extending and expanding the definition that I use, what my definition allows for is that it is something that a person can feel that, again, is something that can be situational. So, for example, It can certainly feel like a betrayal if somebody discovers that your partner or some other person important to you has lied to you about something that could involve anything from finances to whatever exactly it would be. They have lied to you. Certainly that'll feel like a betrayal. Mm -hmm. What can also feel like a betrayal is if, for example, on the job, you have been led to believe that your job is secure. You've been led to believe that by an employer who has seemed very trustworthy, seems to have had your best interest at heart, been very reassuring, only to discover a week later that you get a notice that your job is being discontinued. And while that's part of life these days, if the message you got is that you can pretty much count on your job continuing, and then you get noticed like that, that can certainly feel like a betrayal. And, um, Just give one more example that jumps out at me is child abuse. Child abuse. A child grows up feeling as though, whether they can consciously put it into words or not, especially if they're real young, even if a child can't put it into words, they have every reason to think that they're going to be treated well. They're going to be treated with love. They're going to be treated with TLC. And so if there is abuse, For that child, even if the word may not be something, again, they can consciously identify or articulate, that most certainly can feel like a very significant betrayal and unfortunately occurring at a very early vulnerable stage of life. So those are a few examples that jump out at me. Right. Wonderful. Yeah. So now if we can just break apart each one. So let's say that there's a couple and there's been infidelity. They come into your office how do they come in? What are the things that they're experiencing on both sides? Because it's not just about, I don't want to just talk about the betrayer. Let's talk about the betrayer as well. Are they coming in? Uh, well, you two, you tell me, what does it look like? There are different ways that this can present itself in my office. There are instances in which the betrayed will come right out, if not in the first session, pretty quickly and express their considerable feeling of betrayal that their partner has engaged in infidelity. There are other instances, and and I'll follow up on that in a moment. Uh, There are other instances, though, in which I may not be privy to that information, 
because either the betrayed is not ready to disclose it, the betrayor does not know that the betrayed actually knows that the betrayer committed an infidelity. So there are different presenting scenarios that can come up. But let's go at the moment with the scenario that it is being brought to my attention. The betrayed is letting me know that the betrayer has engaged in an act of infidelity. Now, if that's what's presented to me, sure, at that moment, I know that I'm dealing with the infidelity betrayal. However, what then becomes a very significant variable in terms of what I'm going to address, in terms of the potential for healing from this, is how much does the betrayed define the betrayal as something that is overwhelming to them? Is it something that basically now puts the relationship in a position of, at, at best, it's now on the line, and at worst, the betrayed is saying, I'm done. I'm done. It's black and white. So as much as the betrayer may virtually plead their case that, and often rationalizations will come in, oh, it was just this one time. Oh, it's nothing ongoing. Oh, it wasn't physical. I mean, you hear it all in here as to how the betrayer may react. Mm -hmm. As opposed to there are occasions, sure, the betrayer will come clean, so to speak, acknowledge it. But getting back to the betrayed for the moment, the person who's feeling betrayed, it really comes down, Debbie, as much as anything to the word tolerableness. And there really is under the heading of the word tolerableness of a betrayal, a dictionary definition of different strokes to different folks. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I might be working with someone who's telling me they're betrayed. What they may also be telling me, if not right there, but as soon as the session proceeds, more discussion takes place, that when push comes to shove, it's difficult, certainly, for them to have found this out. It certainly hurts very much. Mm -hmm. But there's something in them that's saying somehow it's tolerable. It's not acceptable by any stretch. Mm -hmm. It may not even be the least bit forgivable. But the password here becomes tolerable. Mm -hmm. If the betrayal feels tolerable to the person who's been betrayed, then I get a sense that there is room for healing, as opposed to if the person who feels betrayed is saying it's outright intolerable. Mm -hmm. Then the odds are, and it's probably obvious to say, but just to emphasize, the chances of healing, the chances of forgiveness are pretty slim. Right. So that's the perspective of the betrayed. What's helpful or harmful for the betrayer? What makes that work or doesn't work? Or, you know, helps it, hurts it from the betrayer's perspective? Well, it's obviously an important question. And again, it'll be a different strokes for different folks. There are some betrayers that will adamantly either deny that they engage in the infidelity outright, no matter how much there may be pretty compelling evidence, you know, these days, of course, there's cell phone evidence, there's you know, reports from friends or people who find out and let the betrayed know. So for the moment, let's go with the betrayer is in denial. And again, it can be pretty adamant. So that's one possibility. And in that case, clearly, there's not going to be much room, at least at that point, for any attempt to, to heal, to address this, to work together to see if the foundation of the relationship may now be a bit cracked, certainly, but you know, can the cracks still be filled? Mm -hmm. If, however, the betrayer does acknowledge, confess, come clean, that they engaged in the act of betrayal, then the issue becomes, where do they go with it from there? Mm -hmm. There's two possible directions the betrayer can go. They can acknowledge and confess, they engage in an act of infidelity, but there's still room, you see it enough in here, in this office, there's still room for them to downplay it, to rationalize it. Again, the rationalizations can be, oh, it was only one time, oh, it was, it was just emotions and nothing physical, et cetera. Or what also sometimes the betrayer will do is they will shift the blame. And this is where the opportunity or possibilities for healing really go down, even if the betrayer has come clean, if the betrayer's basic message to the person they betrayed is, basically, you drove me there. Mm. You didn't pay enough attention. 
you were out a lot, you were always uh, complaining to me, et cetera, et cetera. If the betrayer takes the externalizing of the blame stand, need I tell you, that's really going to create a very big obstacle for potential for betrayal. I'm right. sorry, for potential for healing. Yeah. Well, well, of course, it's that not taking responsibility is aggravating at the very least. So let's say that there is that tolerableness and there is room for healing. What does healing look like in that scenario? From that moment on, what do you see? It behooves the betrayer, assuming that they are willing to take accountability, responsibility. If they are at that point, then there is the blessing potentially of the healing. And as far as what the betrayer needs to do, and I emphasize this all the time when I'm working either with a couple together and addressing the betrayer, or the betrayer may be coming for help just by themselves. Either way, there are three things that I emphasize are essential to have any chance of creating healing, creating forgiveness, et cetera. Number one, maybe the most obvious, is a sincere, heartfelt apology, a sincere demonstration of remorse, regret, and it comes from the heart. It's done by looking at the betrayed right in the eye. And sure, there are instances in which there are pathological liars out there, but I'm going now with the truth of someone who is sincerely apologizing and experiencing sincere remorse and regret. So that's step one. Step two is a commitment that the person, the betrayer, needs to make to the person they betrayed that they're going to make amends. And the making of amends is going to involve basically bending over backwards, Debbie, by the betrayer to do everything they can to make it up to the betrayed, to give slowly but surely the betrayed the message that they are going to be made to feel special again. They are going to be made to feel that, not again, just that what the betrayer feels they did is terrible, but it's going to involve anything along the lines of whatever it really comes down to to show more specialness, spending more time, um, going more on date night, uh, buying flowers, the proverbial kinds of things that, plus though, I want to be sure to add on the making amends front, there can also be things that the betrayed will tell the betrayer are part of what she needs the betrayer to do that would really be in her eyes the best ways to make amends. So the making amends is absolutely essential. And then the third piece of the healing requires that the betrayer not just say that they're going to make amends, but actions speak louder than words. They have to demonstrate that ongoingly. And I mean ongoingly can be months and months. There's no time frame. There's no statute of limitations, so to speak. If the betrayer really means business about doing what they can to create the healing that can allow the betrayed person to feel that they really can open up their hearts again, that's what it behooves the betrayer to do, all three pieces. Mm, That's wonderful. And then two questions. The first is, and I know it's different for everybody how long it takes someone to be willing to even recognize these steps as, okay, this person really means it and I can begin to trust again. Uh, What's an average timeline you see when it's best case scenario? There's the ownership, there's the change that you're, that the the person is seeing and the consistency. Best case scenario, still unpredictable as it is, as you realize, for the most part, is I'd say six months to a year. Now, what I want to be sure to add when I, when I make that statement is there are a couple of variables there above and beyond some of what I've already mentioned. For example, gearing back in on the person who was betrayed, big part of the time frame is along the way of those weeks and months, how much the betrayed can work through their own emotional pain, their own deep sense of being hurt, their own sense of deep mistrust that will still be in place, certainly 
about the betrayer for that's a certainly unpredictable amount of time. So if the betrayed can get their hurt um, more manageable, more under control, certainly not to go away, that's of course impossible, but reach a point where how hurt they feel is not overwhelming. It's going to be there. It's going to be there for a long time. But again, I'll use the password manageable. So if the betrayed comes to feel their hurt is manageable, then we get to the issue of mistrust. That mistrust is if the hurt is healed from to at least some degree, then mistrust becomes the key variable for the betrayed. And that's something that the person who's betrayed has to be, I, I emphasize this over and over to my patients. The person who's been betrayed has to be totally honest with themselves about that rebuilding of trust. If they really want the relationship to heal, let's assume that for the moment. I mean, obviously it can come to a point where the betrayed gives it some time and just decides, no, I can't and I don't want this relationship to heal. I'm done. But assuming they're taking the position that they do want it to heal, then the issue of mistrust looms tremendous. And the person who's been betrayed has to be totally honest with themselves about how much the feeling of trust is coming back. If slowly but surely it is, and the hurt has become more manageable, you put those two things together, and the betrayed can, can open up their hearts again, assuming, of course, the betrayer stays on the making amends path. Now, there's one more piece of this, though. Let me now switch back to the betrayer. I tell the betrayers this all the time. What is very challenging for many betrayors is an issue of patience. And what I mean by that in this context, Debbie, is the betrayor sees themselves as having basically done all three steps. They've given the sincere apology and demonstrated the remorse. They have committed to making amends, and they've been consistently going ahead in their actions and making amends. Now, if the betrayer has been doing that, what can happen is that the betrayer can think, well, see, I'm proving that I meant business. I'm proving that I really do love her, still want her to see how much I find her special, and that I really want us to be as back in love as we can be. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, so to speak, she may not be going at, I'll call it, the same pace of openness. In other words, he's basically more and more going to be thinking and feeling, well, isn't it kind of time that you really do start to trust me again? She may at the same time equally be feeling, no, it's not there yet. And he might ask, and it does come up, well, how much longer do you think it'll be? And not necessarily in, a, in an attacking way or, or a judgmental way. He just really needs her to be more open to getting the trust back. Well, his patience level becomes a crucial factor because, again, I'm calling it an issue of pacing. The pace at which she may need to really get the trust back may definitely be longer than his need for her to have that trust come back. And if that's what transpires over a period of time, it can still end up being a stalemate. Right. It seems like if it's a choice between the betrayer or the betrayed's timeline, the betrayed should have the the right to decide the length of time the healing takes. And I agree with that statement 100 percent, Debbie. That is the bottom line. For the betrayed, when I make that clear, that's what they want to hear. But I'm not just saying it because that's what they want to hear. It is because what I believe it is because that's my professional experience in terms of the potential for healing and rebuilding a, a foundation of true love. Of course, on the other hand, that isn't necessarily what the betrayer is going to want to hear. So for them, it is then a matter of they're still coming to see me. They still want to try to make this work. Then I'm doing what I can to reinforce that message for the betrayer. It's, of course, up to them in the weeks and months as they continue to go by, whether they can hold on to that message, whether they can therefore hold on to the patients, and if they can, 
things can still work out. If they can't, it's really unlikely that that foundation's cracks are going to be filled. Right. And you know what what I've seen just in my work, that the betrayed feels the pressure, like they've been going through it for a while, they're trying their best to heal, and then they're getting pressured from the betrayer because the betrayer is doing the work, is being consistent. So then they, they're they trying to rush their healing and maybe rush into forgiveness. What happens when the betrayed is trying too hard to to rush to forgive too early? What do you, What do you see in those scenarios? It's virtually guaranteed to backfire. Mm. if not in the short run, in the long run. Because what's happening, chances are for the betrayed, is the password here to me, Debbie, has to be the word need. If the betrayed's needs for the relationship to be healed and rebuilt, needs for anything that can go under the heading of basic needs for an individual and in a relationship, needs for companionship, needs to not be alone, Um, if there's kids involved, if there's financial dependence, needs to not break off the relationship and hurt the other person that can actually still be there in the mix. Mm -hmm. Anything under the heading of the word needs can drive the betrayed to, I'd call it almost make a compromise with themselves, Mm -hmm. to go in the direction of attempting to heal, attempting to rebuild but it's more out of the needs than the genuine want. And, and it's a crucial distinction, I think, Debbie, between want and need. Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. the betrayed wants at least as much, but not certainly more even, than needs the relationship to be rebuilt, especially based on the betrayer doing all the right things, then at that point, it's pretty healthy for the betrayed to move forward. Mm-hmm. However, again, if the betrayed, in being totally honest with themselves, is coming more from a position of needs. Well, needs are human, and we Mm -hmm. are all human. However, in the face of still feeling the the pain and the the psychological torment of having been betrayed, to give in to those needs, while it's human, it can also be something that the betrayed can come to regret. Mm -hmm. Uh, That almost feels like self-betrayal, not respecting their own rules and needs and whatever's whatever's within them. I'm sorry, that's a perfect way to put it. Perfect way to put it. Go right ahead. Yeah. So now that's in the, the scenario where let's say there's a, a willingness to try to work things out and, and try to come to a, a new type of relationship after a betrayal. What happens when there's no closure, when there's that flat out denial and let's say the betrayer moves on, what does the betrayed do to find that closure, to deal with that sense of maybe injustice, frustration, pain, whatever they're going through? Let me ask you this. When you say the betrayer moves on, are Mm -hmm. you saying moves on while staying in the relationship or exits? No, exits the relationship. They've betrayed their partner. They found someone new, whatever it is. And now the betrayed is left with no closure. They've been absolutely blindsided and you know, and all of the physical, mental, emotional, psychological, every, you know, all the challenges that come with that. How do you work with someone like that who's been through a betrayal and then they don't even have the opportunity to hear the regret, the remorse, the apology, the anything? That certainly is about, as you can imagine, as painful an outcome as any that could happen for the betrayed, assuming that the betrayed still feels the love that they have felt for the betrayer. Someone who ends up in that position can feel a a depth of pain. It can be a depth of depression, certainly clinically speaking. That can be psychologically tormenting, no question about it. So if the betrayed reaches that point, as certainly is a possibility, then I look at it as they're going to need to muster up all of the courage, the strength, and the resources that they can to proverbial one day at a time, be able to heal from this, especially you just brought up the word blindsiding and I wanted to go with that. And I meant to mention it before. I'm glad you brought it up. It really are two kinds of betrayals in a way. One is you see some signs or clues that the betrayal is coming. It's still a betrayal and it still will be 
psychologically devastating, potentially, yes. But if you're outright blindsided, there were no clues. You didn't see it coming. No question that is psychologically even worse. It's the worst of two evils, so to speak. So if there's been a blindsiding, the healing process will be an even bigger challenge. Just wanted to mention that. Now, as far as the mustering up the resources and so forth, the betrayed is going to need to make a commitment to themselves, first of all, to want to heal. And I put it that way, Debbie, because there are people who are betrayed, and I'm sure when I say this, you'll, you'll know what I mean, who are so devastated, who are so overwhelmed that their ability to function on a day-to-day basis becomes challenged. I'm not saying they don't function at all, but again, I'm sure you know what I mean. It can be difficult to get up in the morning. It can be difficult to fulfill responsibilities. It can be difficult to to talk to people, to be available to people. So certainly to be able to heal, if it's reached that kind of rock bottom point, will be a heck of a challenge. Now that said, as far as what it takes, certainly one of the things that takes as much as anything is to seek out comfort. If there are people in your life that you know you can turn to for comfort, whether it's relatives, whether it's friends, whoever it may be, God knows you're going to need comfort. But what you're also going to need, whenever I address the subject of comfort with somebody who's been betrayed, I immediately follow that right up with self-comfort or self-soothing. And I want to be sure to mention something on that front, Debbie. There are a lot of people I've learned over the years who were never taught how to comfort themselves. And I'm going to interject a bit of a personal note here. That applies to me unconditionally, unequivocally, and I believe it applies to a lot of people. You can get some comfort growing up, sure, assuming you have gotten comfort from one parent, both parents, other adults, et cetera. But if either you really haven't gotten a whole lot of comfort growing up and or you weren't shown how to do it for yourself, much less both, you're really behind the eight ball in through adult life in terms of how to comfort yourself in the face of significant psychological pain. So teaching yourself, if it's not something that comes very naturally, so self-comfort, that again is another different strokes for different folks thing. For example, for one person, self-comfort be taking a warm bath. Another person, it could be reading an affirmation. Another person, it could be some kind of exercise, uh, some kind of soothing music, et cetera, et cetera. People who have been betrayed need self-comfort as much as they need to be comforted by others, particularly when other people who could be comforters are simply not available or the person just doesn't want to turn to them for whatever reason. Yeah, and, and it's it's that's the time where there's so much, I've found so much shame, judgment, embarrassment, and they need yeah. the support the most, and that's where they're the least likely to seek the support. That's exactly right. Shame and embarrassment are so psychologically toxic to a person's ability to feel they're at all worth loving anymore, that they're at all worthwhile as a person. So yes, absolutely right. The shame and embarrassment can be a a significant obstacle to actually reaching out for comfort and can even interfere again with the self-comfort piece. So those feelings are part and parcel. Assuming someone has been betrayed decides, though, as part of their healing to come for help, to come for professional therapy or counseling. As much as any, helping to heal from this, this terrible feeling of being betrayed, being rejected, to get past the shame and embarrassment is essential for the, the healing to have a chance to take place. So that very much needs to be in the mix. Right. So it's the seeking support, the self, uh, just self-care, self-love, self, any, giving yourself something after you've been traumatized. What's the role of psychotherapy in all this? The role of psychotherapy is a combination as I look at it. It's a combination of things. One is at bare minimum and very significant. If I use the words bare minimum, I don't want to minimize this at all. To give the person an opportunity to vent vent to somebody who will be objective, who's certainly not going to judge, who is going to be able to not get caught up in what the the loved ones, the friends will get caught up in, in terms of the intensity of their emotions. 
therapy provides an opportunity to have somebody really listen, demonstrate the compassion that is warranted, as well as give a therapist the opportunity to sort of balance the listening to all the venting, to all the painful sharing, to be able to gently direct the person who's been betrayed, in this case, the betrayed patient, to be able to look at taking little baby steps, to take little positive baby steps to begin the healing process. Again, such as the self-care, self-soothing pieces, such as getting themselves little by little involved. It could be, for example, a support group. That is another option, not necessarily involving directly uh, loved ones. Um, but, but that is essential. Right. And what can someone hope for or expect? Let's say they, they take these measures, they go this route, they're on their own to, to heal from their betrayal uh, without, let's say, the opportunity of rebuilding that relationship. They go through this. What does change and in, in healing look like for them? Slowly but surely. There's a rebuilding of self-confidence. Slowly but surely, there's a rebuilding of self-esteem. Slowly but surely, there's a sense of being lovable. And really, in a way, best of all, I'd say, is coming to realize that the person who betrayed them, as much as the betrayed may still miss them, miss the relationship, the betrayal notwithstanding, as much as anything, what the betrayed can gain out of therapy and the rest of the support they gain is a realization they are still very much worthwhile, very much still lovable, and slowly but surely, it obviously will take time, to get themselves ready to open themselves up to somebody who's a lot more deserving than the betrayer. Someone who will be the right person and will respect and will appreciate and will love all of the ways the betrayed has healed and grown. Mm. And what I've seen time and time again, we realize we're so much stronger than we think. Dr. Sidney, what do you want to make sure everybody knows before we wrap up? To never underestimate your resilience. To know that if there's anything in life that counts plenty, in terms of your own individual self-worth, your own individual growth, potential to have the best possible relationships, is that you have resiliency within you and you have courage. And if I can just quickly add to that, I have a definition of courage, Debbie, that I use as much as I have definitions of terms like betrayal. I define courage as anything you're reluctant or hesitant to do, but you make yourself and push yourself to do it anyway because it's always in your best interest to do that. We all can at one time or another in our lives, in the face of betrayal or anything else that can be very stressful, we can underestimate our courage. We need to muster up the courage and we need to be able through mustering up the courage to then take positive steps to prove to ourselves, again, we really are lovable. We never deserve this betrayal. Gotta be sure to emphasize that. I actually forgot to mention it. Key words, Come to believe and be absolutely certain you didn't deserve it. Mm, absolutely. And I think that's a wonderful place to end. Where can we learn more about you? What I have is a Facebook business page, Dr. Sidney Cohen. And I want to be sure to mention that uh, I wrote a book. It's called uh, Your Self Sabotaging Inner Bully Standing Up to It Once and For All. And what I'd like to offer is. I have a chapter in my book on the subject of betrayal. It's a whole chapter. And I'm, I'm offering people who are listening to sign up and receive a free copy of that chapter. I'd be more than willing to do that. I very much welcome that. And to make that happen, you can go to my Facebook business page, click on email sign up, and I assure you I will make that happen. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to have all of that in the show notes, too. So this way, you know, That's if someone's great. driving or something, they don't have to worry about writing it down. We're going to have all of that available for them. That's terrific. And I also do have a website, and that is another option. Terrific. I want to thank you so much. You shed such light on such a painful topic, but I'm sure you gave the listeners a lot of hope as well, that we can always bounce back better than before with the right tools, resources, and a plan. And I think that's wonderful. 
It was great being here, Debbie. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. I want to thank Dr. Cohen so much for being on the show. You can learn more about Dr. Cohen's work at sydneyjcohenphd.com. And we'll have the information for you in the show notes at pbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast so you can stay in touch with him. Here's my biggest takeaway. Support from a non-biased friend or therapist is crucial after betrayal. Here's where we're the least likely to seek support, and here's where we need it the most. Find someone you can trust, and it's important. It's really, really important in your healing process and next steps. If you haven't already, be sure to take the quiz to see if you're struggling from post-betrayal syndrome at pbtinstitute.com forward slash quiz and let us support you. Go to Facebook and join our group Women Hacking Betrayal, where we give information, tools, and support to help you move forward and heal once and for all. Can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough.